also of the season at half back. He's played on the wing and the centre, all across the back line. It kind of was a, I think, a situation of we want to put Jack Wellsby in the team to recognise how consistently good he's been everywhere he's played this year, and where's the place we can put him? Centre, obviously felt right for that, but. I mean, the the other point that was made about the person, who, the, the potential players who've missed out at prop over Cassiano. What what do you make of that from a Hull FC perspective? Um, I mean, I think Sata has been immense. Um, however, um, selection was maybe more heavily weighted towards the back end of the season. Um, whereas if you look at some of his earlier season matches, you know, he was, you know, running at people, making yards for fun and tackling everything that moved. Yeah, I, I, I'd have probably, in fact, I'll get my team up that I uh, did and we'll run through when they, you know, when they got us to, when they said, when they put it up on the website and we could do our nominations because I had quite a few differences although I think what they've chosen uh, in some areas is more sensible so I went with Widdop and Lomax in my halfbacks I, I thought Widdop being on that five shortlist like I just said there was a period of the season where he was the best player uh, I I went with Kenny Dowell and Mamo in the centres uh, I think Mamo needs to be recognised his try scoring output has been fantastic this season second yeah. top try scorer in Super League uh, and, I, and I think Co's only really got in there to be honest because of his try scoring record yeah. which justifiable isn't it if you're the top try scorer I went with Hall and Davies but when I voted for this I think was a just before Co took over that really like ran away in the back two weeks of the season or so with that top try scorer so I probably would have gone Co over Hall in the end um I just, I think, I don't think Percival's been anywhere near his best this year. Yeah, I think he's had well, four or five good had games. Or Wellsby in there as my centres. Yeah, I can't argue with Wellsby being in the team because he has been fantastic wherever he's played. But then it's like he's played everywhere rather than one place, and he certainly doesn't deserve to be in fullback over Tompkins, for example. Um, yeah. I went with Ben Garcia as my 13, and your, what you said about the the whole prop forwards being overlooked maybe because of the back-end form rather than the sort of early and mid-season form. Garcia, when he got injured in, what was it, probably June maybe, at that point he was by far the outstanding loose forward in the competition this season. And I think it's an injustice. Even though Morgan Knowles is great, is fantastic, he's been almost perfect since he came back into the side... I'm just going to get my stats up and see how many games he's actually played this year because I only think he's played the last half of the season. Um, and so I think we've forgotten just how well Garcia was playing. Yeah. Uh, so Morgan Knowles played... Let me get this. He played 13 games. How many did Garcia play? Ben Garcia played 14 games. Uh, to me, Ben Garcia should Best be the man in that in that me. spot. Uh, I have no problem with Liam Farrell. I know some other people did, but he still is the best second rower in the world. Um, uh, Mike McMeekin was my other second row choice. So I sort of think... I don't disagree with Kane Linnett, but I don't know what you think there. I'm not a big Kane Linnett fan, and not because he plays for Rovers. Um, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent certain who I would have gone for as my other second, as yeah, as my second row. But yeah, I certainly think Leeming's end to the season, whilst he's been playing like what twenty minutes at hooker, then sixty minutes at seven in games, means that his selection is warranted. Um, I I think I went yeah, I'm looking. I went Daryl Clark, but. I wasn't seeing any outstanding hooker. I've got no problem with the Leeming choice in the in the dream team. I went Liggy Sow with my other prop. I thought he's been more consistent over the whole piece than Chris Satai. Chris Satai has had two or three 
maybe four or five absolutely outstanding games where he's had like 200 metres or scored a couple of tries the game in the cup against Wigan, for example. But every game where satire has been good, I've seen Sal be pretty much as good. Uh, I think Sal's got a few more errors to his game and gives away a few more penalties. But I equally, I don't think he gets the plaudits he deserves. Yeah, certainly, so, you know, that's where I'd have gone um, in, in yeah. that regard. But, you know, I think Satai also would have been deserved it over Cassiano in my eyes. Cassiano seems to have got in there for for one one try in the Magic weekend. Yeah. Well, I think it was because he came on, didn't he, and was very influential in that game. And he has, you know, I was, I'm being a bit facetious there, he's been good, yeah. but I, I think that's, that, that to me is the choice of all of the choices in this side, that to me is the one where I'm last left scratching my head a, head a bit thinking, I can think of two guys at Hull that are, are ahead of him. Do, do you know, there's other players as well, I think w- would be fair to have in that conversation. Chris Hill has had his best year in three years and I don't see why him and Cooper aren't ahead of Cassiano. George King at Hull KR has impressed me every single time I've seen him play this year and that's a player who I've never been impressed by ever before. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying there's, there's there's been other players in that position. But, um, yeah. That's my take on it. What we should say is we're going to be putting out our dream team selection for the Super League Pod Awards at some point. Um when I find time, maybe this weekend, uh, to draw up our shortlists. So certainly, you know, ahead of the grand final, we'll uh, we'll get some something up there for people to vote on that. So that'll be the the real dream team. Uh, yeah, the one that, that we people actually are bothered about being in. That's it. Yeah, because then they'll know it's the fans who voted. The people who pay their wages are the ones who will vote for that one. Yeah. Uh, shall we move on to the women's uh, the women's game yeah. with the women's steel, Sarah? So the 2021 Woman of Steel shortlist has been announced. St. Helens and York each have two contenders to become Rugby League's third Woman of Steel when the award is presented alongside the Steve Prescott Man of Steel on Sky Sports on the 4th of October. Saints captain Jodie Cunningham is joined by her teammate and Emily uh, and England captain Emily Rudge on the shortlist. York duo Rhiannon Marshall and Sinead Peach have been nominated for the award along with lead centre Fran Goldthorpe. The Woman of Steel Award was introduced in 2018 with Castleford's George de Roach, the first winner, followed by Leeds captain Courtney Winfield-Hill in 2019. Uh, there was no award last year with the Women's Super League suspended because of COVID, but it returns again this year. I was a little bit surprised that um, that there was two players from York in this, in this um, shortlist and, and not more from... Leeds who'd went the regular season unbeaten but I think there's been a lot of games missed, a lot of injuries um, or you know illness or whatever where people haven't been able to play a lot this year so I, I do think maybe that's meant that the panel haven't seen enough of, of, of all of the people or, or what have you, I certainly haven't seen enough of, of all of the people to say exactly who, I think Amy Hardcastle maybe would have been a name that I would expect to see him from, from this, from St Helens as well, that's not there but to be honest, I think Jodie Cunningham, after her move to loose forward, the influential role she played in Saints this season, going on for that Challenge Cup win after um, Faye Gaskin got her injured very early in that game as well. I just think rolling all those things together, I think she's probably the front runner. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if either of the two Saints players won it. Um, I think it's going to be one of those two. Yeah. Some coaching news. Um, first one, not so surprising uh, after the way the season ended. Wakefield Trinity have appointed interim boss Willie Poaching as head coach after five wins in seven games at the end of the Super League season. The former Trinity player, 48, took over when Chris Chester departed in August Sorry, uh, and secured victories against Warrington, Leeds and Hull KR. Poaching had previously held assistant roles at Leeds, Warrington, Salford and Wakefield. So he's, he's done his apprenticeship and it's it's time for him to step up he passed the audition now he's been uh, 
given the leading role. We had a couple of fan views. Do you want to take us through the first one, Sarah? Yeah, so EFC 78 JU said, after five wins in seven games, Willie Perching has been appointed as Wakefield Trinity's head coach for next season. The former player took over in August after Chris Chester left the club. He previously held assistant <laughs> roles at Salford Warrington and his current club before being interim and promoted to the main spot. Sums up his career quite well. Yep, Tom Andrews said, seemingly inevitable with a good end to season, but it does seem scream cheap option will finish in the bottom four next season i i i mean very often like these guys get a chance don't they and if they do anything like taking it they get the job and I can't argue with this call by Wakefield. I don't know if it's cheap or not. I don't I don't see what the better option would have been. He's got all of their important players playing as well as they've played in, in two and a half seasons. Yeah. It seemed the logical choice. Um, you know, I mean, really, what rationale is there for him not getting it based on you know, what they've accomplished back end of the season. Completely, completely um, agree. Uh, you know, and, and I do think certainly he's got, like I say, he's got their important players playing well. So we'll see if he can continue that on a, on a permanent basis. What What is interesting, Sarah, is nothing I've read has announced how many, like how long the deal is or anything like that. Nothing I've seen. I mean, I, ha- I must admit I haven't done exhaustive so- searches. I've been pretty busy this, this last week, but I don't, I haven't seen like how long it's been announced for and EFC and his little um, write up didn't, didn't mention it either. So maybe it's not a long-term deal and, um, and we'll see if that can spur him on like the audition period did. Yeah. Yeah. But he clearly had those players playing for him. Yeah, for sure. Someone who doesn't anymore, Sarah? Yeah. So Salford Red Devils have passed company with head coach Richard Marshall by mutual consent after one season in charge at the AJ Bell. The 45-year-old succeeded Ian Watson, who left for Huddersfield after taking Salford to the grand final and Challenge Cup final appearances in 2019 and 2020. However, the Red Devils finished bottom, second bottom of the Super League this time with only seven wins from 22 games. EFC 78JU um, said, after one full season at Salford, Richard Marshall has parted company with them after finishing second bottom of the table. They are now in the search for a, again for a new coach for the second time. Salford won only seven matches from 22 matches under him. Yeah, and Tom Andrews said, wrong decision in my opinion. A coach can't build a team in a year, especially with the budget Salford have. Wouldn't shock me for him to take over at Lee. Uh, David Dallymore as well got in touch Sarah, uh, a late one came in from David. He said, they are going down the shithole, will be relegated next year. They have no proper 5-8. Croft a good signing, but not a proper game manager. Not that, not the best forward pack. They have a decent players, but they don't flow together to create a whole team. I hope I'm wrong, but it's going to be a long year for Salford next year unless they hire a good coach and there's not many on the market at the moment. Pretty strong stuff there. I mean, what do you, what do you make of this? Just giving him one year. I think it's a bit harsh. You know, it's not exactly, you know, being a, a, an easy year to take over. And it's not like he had a stable back room that he was moving into. You know, everything, Watson took everything with him, didn't he? Yeah, well, they still had, um, what's his chops? who used to be the Lee coach, is still there sort of, on the staff, but I think he'd moved into a more of a player development position rather than um, first team coaching kind of position. It, yeah, it, it does I, seem. Go yeah, on. I was just to say no. You know, with with the whole interrupted season and you know having a month off here and a couple of weeks off there and a match not played here and then suddenly four in eight days and whatever, it's. It's rough, isn't it, to judge a bloke on that sort of basis? You certainly can't judge him compared to the, what happened before because I just think that was 
like absolutely above and beyond expectation with with Watson and mm. I don't think Marshall had as good a team certainly David mentioned it but the forward pack um has gone downhill quite a bit in terms of the quality of depth there and then when you throw into it Ikehefer and 